do you look at this period when there is a renewed interest in a Hindu past, quote unquote, uh, is it productive in any way? Has it challenged your perceptions in any way? And how would you perhaps shift the needle on that, uh, you know, in what is problematic about it? You know, I'm puzzled that we think we don't have Hindu points of pride. All stories deserve to be told at all levels of society. Pride does not simply come out of winning battles. I mean, that's a very hyper-masculine way of looking at the past, which then begs questions as to why do you need this, what is this craving for hyper-masculinity that you have? It, it comes from some other place, some sense of insecurity perhaps, which colonialism bred in, in a lot of Indians. The thing is, historians are also creatures of their time. Anything I do now is subject to be revised 25 years from now. It doesn't mean there was a conspiracy of people who sat down and said, oh, this is what we're going to do with Indian history. We have to cover this up and promote this. I don't think that sort of situation ever happened. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shoma Chaudhary. I'm a journalist and a director of Lucid Lines, which is an intellectual properties company. And on behalf of Shivnadar Foundation and the entire Ignition team, I'm really delighted to welcome all of you for this first edition of Ignition. Thank you so much for responding with so much warmth to our invitation. And we're particularly excited to be hosting the first edition in Chennai which is really the kind of cerebrum of the Indian nation. <laughs> so thank you for being here. You know, at a time when we are all being, across the world, being bench pressed into fixed positions and binary ways of looking at each other, Shivnadar Foundation and we are really excited to create a platform called Ignition, because what we want to do in this platform is to celebrate journeys rather than just arrivals, to look for different keys to diverse, dynamic minds, you know, to look for stories of courage and creativity and challenge. And I hope that all the conversations and people that we meet here will remind us really the word ignition, which is the start of things. We are really excited because it's different. It's a roving pop-up platform. It could pop up in any city. We could pop up in your computer. We could pop up on an evening like this. And the fun is to get a lot of people together. We have a lot of young people listening in on this beyond the physical uh, hall. And we hope to bring together a fantastic range of people who, as I said, represent that spirit of ignition. We are particularly excited to partner with Shiv Nadar Foundation because you saw the film about their enterprise, their commitment to education, to creating an equitable society. But particularly as creative entrepreneurs, they are wonderful partners because Shivnadar Foundation's commitment is to creative philanthropy. And as having partnered with them on many occasions before, I can say they're really wonderful. They, they support music, they support the habitats, they support conversations like this. And they're always seeking to bring together, you know, be that synapse between thinking, creative, courageous minds. So, you know, wonderful to partner with them. Shivas, another partner, you know, glassware, but of course all of us are always interested in what's inside the glass and that helps all of us be more cerebral. So, you know, it's wonderful to have the Shivas team here and the Brand Avatar team. There's Hemu Ramaya, who invited a lot of you on our behalf. So all of us at the Ignition team, we are your hosts. Thank you so much for being here. And now to the first session. You know, it's odd when I'm speaking of Ignition and the start of things for the very first session of Ignition to be about history. But in a way, history is also constantly evolving, dialogic, and it is constantly starting and reinventing itself. So in a way, it's fantastic that we are starting an inquiry into our present with an investigation of our past. So I'm particularly excited to have this session. Both young historians, uh, you know, who we were featuring in this session, are scholar detectives. They really are detectives because they are uncovering a past they represent a new kind of scholarship, which is bold, which is individual, which is seeking to find three-dimensionality in our stories. Unfortunately, today, uh, Vikram Sampath has not been able to join us because he's had a very sudden emergency uh, hospitalization. But we have another star of the show 
which is Manu Pillai. Manu has a fantastic body of work. My two favorites are Rebel Sultans, where he looked at the sultans of the Deccan and really overturns our idea of the Deccan and the way we've been taught it in our school books. He's written another book called The Courtesan, The Mahatma and The Italian Brahmin. So that itself tells us how interesting that book is going to be. And he's had a book called The False Allies, which is overturning our perception of the Maharajas as mere lotus eaters. And his first one was The Ivory Throne, uh, where you know, he uncovered a lot of uh, characters from Travancore and he's continued his love affair with Travancore. So we're going to listen to this whole cast of characters that he's unearthed as a detective, but we are also going to be posing to him a lot of these big questions around history that uh, engage all of us. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Manu Pillai. Manu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Manu, as I said, you know, it's fascinating that we're starting a platform called Ignition with a study of history. But in many ways, you know, it is a constant, it's a constantly renewing subject. So I just first want to start with, you know, you can pick any of your books. I would pick the false allies that start with some work of yours, some character of yours that completely overturned the stereotype, you know, uh, which you had before you began working on that book. So pick something from False Allies. Well, before False Allies, I think I'll talk about Malik Kamba from Rebel Sultans. We, when we think of Deccan history, we reduce it to the Mughals versus the Marathas. And obviously, Chhatrapati Shivaji is this big icon there, famous for guerrilla warfare, resisting the Mughals, using his strengths and using their weaknesses against them and so on. And I was very intrigued that, you know, in the 1670s, once Shivaji, you know, crowned himself Chhatrapati, he commissioned a Sanskrit poem. And Sanskrit, because it's meant for a pan-Indian audience, and therefore it's almost like an advertisement of his kingship. And in this particular poem, he pays tribute to an African man called Malik Ambar, which got me thinking, what is this African man doing in a Sanskrit poem by a Hindu king? Again, these are just brackets we, we use, but or labels we use. In reality, the, the, the African man was an inspiration to Shivaji. He died just three years before Shivaji was born. Before Shivaji, it was he who used guerrilla warfare against the Mughals. Shivaji's grandfather worked with him. He's one of his close colleagues. His father was a successor to Malik Ambar in keeping or trying to keep the Mughals outside of, outside of the Deccan. In a sense, if you look at Shivaji and what he achieved in isolation, there's this, I mean, he was obviously something of a hero, but there's this stereotypical heroic narrative that emerges. But you connect him to the larger history of the area and you see that he had his own inspirations. He saw himself following in the footsteps of some other heroes who had come before him, including somebody who was born in Africa, a man who's, who began life as Chapu uh, in Ethiopia, was enslaved from there, taken to Baghdad, brought to India and sold here, where he was purchased by the Peshwa of Ahmednagar, the Peshwa being the Prime Minister. And the Peshwa himself was a black man, which opens up a whole window into the, the presence of Africans in Indian history. And they just dissolved into the Indian population. So we don't really know uh, what happened to them in, in later times, but there was a significant African population. So it turns over a lot of our cliché, stereotypical ideas of how the past evolved. The people in the past were not born heroes and they didn't just emerge out of, fall from the sky as heroic figures. They had their own inspirations, they had their own context, they had their own spaces that they were aware of. Okay. And just as we use history and stories from the past to nourish our own minds, they too perhaps had ways of remembering the past and using that to make sense of their present. So I'm glad you picked uh, Malik Ambar. He's one of the, my favorite characters in uh, you know, Manu's work. He's a complete discovery for me. And there's another, uh, you, know, you, have, you pick Adil Shah of Bijapur who saw himself as the son of Saraswati and, uh, you know, he loved no, Shiva and he loved Shiva. Ganapati. Ganpati. And he loved Shiva, he uh, loved Kathakali, you know, uh, all of that. So, but, you know, if Vikram was here or if other historians or, you know, other interlocutors were here, they would say that historians like you cherry pick the few and far between, uh, you know, Muslim leaders and rulers 
uh, who were secular and liberal or pluralist, and that one suppresses stories of Tipu Sultan or Aurangzeb or even Akbar, uh, which are very uncomfortable, you know? So one, what do you think about that? That has there been a project of suppressing uh, uncomfortable truths about, say, Muslim rulers of the past? And do you think that it's interesting that one is revisiting all of this and new facts are coming up? Well, to begin with, I've never used the term secular for anybody from history because it would be an anachronism. In the past, they didn't have the concept of secularism. Religion was a very important component of people's lives. It still is in India. But my argument really is that our belief that religion was the defining component is a flawed one. It was one of many components. In fact, if you take serious studies of kingship in India, one of the things you will find is that Kings and those in power, kings were the ones in those, in those days, they were the ones in power. And if you were a powerful person, at some point you would attempt to graduate into a king. That was how it worked. Kings did not hesitate to bend religion to their advantage. Now, I'll give you an example. Since you mentioned Tipu Sultan, I come from Kerala. Now, it's true that if you talk about Malabar, he invaded Malabar. So when he's an invader, he uses jihadist language. There are temples he smashed. I went to the ancestral home of uh, Sangama Grama Madhava, the mathematician. And their family temple, they have these two dwarapalas and the arms are missing. Apparently, and the story is, the arms are missing from the, from the sculptures. And the story goes that this was cut off by Tipu's passing army. So there, there is truth to the fact that it was a very violent conquest. And there was a certain kind of jihadist language that was used. But the same Tipu Sultan at the same time is also sending Shivalingas to Sringeri Matha at the same time. So on the one hand, he's asking for pujas to be done in his name. He's protecting the Jagat Guru at Sringeri, and the Jagat Guru is corresponding with him. He's patronizing this place. Now, the important thing here is not religion, it is kingship. He realizes that in that particular part of Karnataka, patronage of Sringeri Matha is an important form to construct legitimacy for himself. When he's conquering a new area, he's going to fall tap on religion, a different religion, a different set of con uh, concepts to legitimize his conquest. And this wasn't specific to Muslim kings alone. In Travancore, there was a king called Martandavarma in the 18th century, shortly before, uh, before Tipu Sultan. Martandavarma. Martandavarma. And Martandavarma, if you look at his Darbar narrative, which is a Sanskrit play called the Bala Martanda Vijaya, it says that, oh, you know, God appeared to him in a dream and said, you must have, you know, must conquer all these states uh, all the way up to the Himalayas and bring back all the gold and reconstruct my temple, the Padmanabha Swami temple. So everything he does as per the Balamartha and Vijaya is what God has ordained. At the same time, you have something called the Villapattus of Nanjanat. Villapattus is basically uh, bow songs that are sung, I think, by the Nadar community there, which gives you a counter view. He's seen as a treacherous, unreliable, cunning figure who wins through bribery by stabbing people in the back. So you have that version of the king. You have a version of the king who degrades Brahmins he doesn't like. So there are these Brahmin chieftains called Nambiadaris. He makes them perform degrading acts and reduces them to funeral priests. He plunders temples. Uh, there are multiple sources. In the, uh, the Panenar Kava temple, for example, has a story about how his men came there to collect all the gold. And it was the Devi's divine power that pushed them back. It's a legend. It's an oral narrative. But it's communicating something to us. That even this feared King Martandavarma was small fry in front of the goddess. But the point of the story is that he did not hesitate to come and seize the goddess's goods. Uh, in Etimanur, he, he attacked the temple, and in return, he, he, afterwards, he fell ill or something, so he believed there was a curse on him, and he donated seven and a half gold elephants, etc. There's a big festival around that even today. The point is, Martandav, so how do we label him? He, he defeated the Dutch in the 1740s. So was he a nationalist for doing that? Was he a tyrant for enslaving his enemies, selling their women and children into slavery? Uh, was he uh, an evil figure for plundering Hindu temples? The point is, it's not about the labels. It's about understanding the times, the context, and the situation in which all this happened, and placing the man in his time. We are very comfortable with labels. We tend to fall into the trap of these, these labels like secular, these, these terms that make sense to us, because we are using history and mining it for our own uh, politics, our own sense of the present. But that's history in terms of how it's memory and how we apply it in our present. History as a discipline works slightly more dispassionately, where you try and look at things in context and you don't fall into this trap of labels and binaries. Uh, it's not black and white, even though you and I are wearing ironically black and white on stage. Oh yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, but you know, like I said, if, if Vikram was here, I was very keen to ask 
two young historians who are doing this kind of detective work, that what is it about his work, Vikram's work, that may have come of, been of interest to you? You know, has he uncovered something that challenged your understanding, your stereotypes that you've lived with, uh, you know, your perspective of, say, Savarkar or Tipu Sultan? So one is that, that, you know. The other is that there's a very strong sense that there was a certain narrative of the past because of partition or etc. that we wanted to create uh, an image of India, which is that it's ma many pieces in a jigsaw where you know, everyone contributed to the idea of India. The uh, current scholarship is trying to uncover what is more a Hindu past. You know? So I want to, your response on both of those. Like I said, I want to kind of have the ghost of Vikram here right now. So first, is there any work that he's done which you as a historian found very interesting and which challenged your perspective? I did review the first volume of his Savarkar book and I thought it was a fair review where I said that he's touched a lot of sources, he's gone through the archives very clearly, material in London, in India, private papers, all of that. So the archival work was very strong. My one criticism was that critical in interrogation of many of those writings was weak. So, for instance, um, anything Savarkar says in his memoirs is accepted at face value, or at least that's the impression I got. Whereas I would have actually asked questions of that itself, saying why is he, 30 years later, if he's remembering something a certain way, it's interesting to ask why is he remembering it that way. And we do that to all sources. Whenever we, we interrogate any historical material, we ask questions such as why is it written in Sanskrit, for example, or in Persian which means it gives you a sense of who the intended audience is and what the goal of the text itself is. Uh, so you ask questions like that. You don't merely rely on written evidence in a country that was very, uh, let's say only the elites were literate, a very small sliver of society. Much of our history or historical consciousness was remembered through song, through law, through oral narratives, much of which has not been codified. It still circulates in oral uh, systems, which you know you need to bring on board. Anyway, coming back to Savarkar, I, I wasn't... So there's this whole online thing about Savarkar having written mercy petitions and so on. To me, frankly, that's the weakest link in critiquing Savarkar. Because that's an easy social media pointing fingers, laughing. It's almost like a bully tactic. Haha, you wrote mercy petitions while you were in a horrible prison. I wouldn't see that as the main uh, point of argument. There's a lot more to critique Savarkar on. And reducing it just to these mercy petitions is a bit of a, a weak thing to do. And there I thought Vikram had, had made some uh, contribution, which was valuable. So also, Savarkar's early phase, in fact, he was a revolutionary for many years. And I have this theory that if Savarkar had been hanged in 1911, as opposed to being thrown into prison for the next 10 odd years, perhaps we'd have been seeing him as a, as a hero, because he would have died on the noose as a revolutionary. But something in those prison years changed the man completely, and he emerges from prison and then becomes the father of Hindutva. So for me, those prison years are very interesting to ask the question, what happened in those 10 years that transformed a man who was singing about Hindu-Muslim unity uh, uh, prayer, you know, in, in his books? He wrote book, the first book of uh, independence. 18, 1857. It was reviewed favorably by, by Nehru, for example, who wrote about it in a letter to his father. I think Savarkar had shared stage with Gandhi at some point in London. What happened to that man in prison that he emerged from it so different versus other freedom fighters who also went into prison? Vio Chidambaram Pillai came out almost a broken man and abandoned by many of his old friends. Others came out and somehow became even bigger celebrities. Gandhiji, Nehru made, you know, it was almost fashionable to go to prison after a certain point. So it's interesting to therefore ask, those are the questions I would ask. Instead of just pointing fingers and saying, haha, you wrote mercy petitions. That's not, that's whatever. It makes for good social media tweets and likes, but it's not, historically, it's not the interesting question. The interesting question is what happened in those, uh, in those prison years. So, Manu, you know, just sticking for a little bit with Savarkar, and I'm sticking with him because he's been of interest and in, in our public conversation, that in this attempt to constantly revisit history and find new ways of understanding ourselves, uh, you know, I had a chat with Vikram earlier. And for me, his Savarkar book was a big discovery because, like you said, I didn't know about those early years. And other historians had suppressed that part. You know, one thought of him only as the father of Hindutva, but he was a revolutionary. He believed, you know, he, he did a lot of uh, sort of passionate work, even for solid Hindu-Muslim solidarity. So Vikram's uh, 
I had two interesting points to make. One, he said it was the Khilafat movement and Gandhi's support of the Khilafat movement, which actually really reinforced uh, Savarkar's view that, you know, th this is appeasement and that this nation must be for the Indic born. And a second thing he said, which I thought would be very interesting for all of you, is that, you know, there's this great uh, argument over the idea of India as whether it predates, whether it's always been one civilization. Uh, and he said that, you know, the, from the Puranas or the Mahabharat to Shankaracharya, you know, the, to the time of Alexander, he had historians who, uh, sorry, he had sources that described the sacred geography of India. So, uh, some, uh, some Vikram made an interesting point. He said that it was actually mischievous that Savarkar uses the word that everyone who treats this as their Purna Bhumi and Janam Bhumi are the only ones who are valid citizens. And he said he could have used the word Bharat rather than Hindu and there would have been no argument because everyone would say, yes, we are from Bharat. It's the mischievous use of the word Hindu that you know, and he actually says it's actually a mischievous word. So, what do you think about that? You know, that is there a sacred geography? Was there a civilizational consciousness which Marxist historians have denied? What would be your take? Well, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's become a season where everybody baits historians of the past. Romila Thapar has become this arch villainous, for example, which is all exaggerated, frankly. The thing is, historians are also creatures of their time. Now, if you take uh, an analogy I often give is if you take Jadunath Sarkar and that generation that worked in the 1920s, for example, uh, they would never have understood a feminist perspective on history. For them, it would simply have not made any sense. Today, we don't do history without bringing on board the feminist perspective because the way we look at the same material has changed. In future, there will be an LGBTQ perspective of history. That will change the way we look at a lot of familiar characters. It's natural. And it's happening. It's going to keep happening. Anything I do now is subject to be revised 25 years from now. It doesn't mean there was a conspiracy of people who sat down and said, oh, this is what we're going to do with Indian history. We have to cover this up and promote this. I don't think that sort of situation ever happened. In terms of this whole idea of civilizational consciousness, again, this is where I make the difference between historical consciousness, memory, and history as we know it now. Now, we talk about sacred geography, Puranas, you know, there were Brahmins everywhere. Sanskrit was a trans-regional language that connected the country. Uh, anywhere you go, or most places you go in India, people would have heard of the Mahabharata, the Ramayana. So it wasn't necessarily the Vedas, it wasn't necessarily very philosophical texts, but there was a lived, textured version of Hindu culture that existed across the country and was adapted by people in various ways. In Kerala, there's the Mapala Ramayana of the Muslims where, uh, where uh, Shurpanakha propositions Rama and he says, sorry, I'm married already. And she, she simply says, that's fine. The Sharia allows you to take a second wife. She actually quotes the Sharia in this version of the Ramayana. So I think the epics were something of a connecting thread. There were some concepts that a lot of at least elite Indians would have understood. I, my ancestors in Kerala would not have known the geographical location of Kashi, but they would have known of Kashi as a concept, for example. That would have happened. They would have known where Rameshwaram was as a concept, a vague sense, not that any of them actually went there. So there was something like that, but I would argue that it was at a relatively elite level. As you go further down the caste order, further down uh, the social system, people became and their identities became more and more localized. The difference is this, was not a, this wasn't a nation. You can't use the word nationalism or nation for what existed in the past. Consciousness of such, of such a nature existed in Europe also. You know, they had a common uh, set of values and concepts they worked with. They were also multilingual. But there was a certain common set of common connecting threads that existed in Europe also. We were also a subcontinent. We are a huge space. There are so many diversities here. Of course, there are going to be some common elements. And there's a lot of diversity also. The issue is not that it's an either-or. We again fall into this trap of either-or, either this or that. It's both at different segments of society, both depending on what context you're speaking from, etc. If I'm a Brahmin sitting in Kerala, Nambudri Brahmin, perfectly free in Sanskrit, I'm probably reading similar texts to a Brahmin sitting in Kashmir also, because he's also, or he or she, well, less she's, but he would be fluent in Sanskrit as well, often transacting with the same texts. But if I go into, say, Telugu literature, very unlikely that a Malayali sitting in Kerala is familiar with Telugu literature and Shetraya and, you know, all of, all of, the, of yeah. the Bhakti poetry that came out in, in, in Telugu country. So, again, it's a question of 
context, who we are talking about, and in what situation and what uh, level of society. I think that would uh, be one way of looking at it. So, most of all, you are kind of arguing for a kind of history that does not look the way you and I do, like black and white, you know. And while he's sharing this story, I was remembering. Uh, some other fascinating characters from his books, which I'm going to ask him to speak about. But one was, uh, I think you mentioned Arthur Cotton, who was a complete imperialist. But I was fascinated to know that a lot of farmers and subalterns actually uh, pray to him and remember him because he built amazing canal and irrigation systems, you know. And you've spoken of Curz Lord Curzon, the vilest of the imperialists who did a lot to protect monuments and temples and a lot of what we are now able to engage with as our history is there's something that he protected. Even in the Taj Mahal, there's a, ha there's a lamp that hangs and he's the one who installed it there. A great expense bringing it from Egypt, for example. This is the thing. Even colonialism, it's fashionable to say evil, you know, terrible, whatever. It's true. As a system, it was an oppressive, exploitative system. But again, it's much more complex than just reducing it to one punchy line. Now, it was colonialism that allowed a lot of Dalits to go to school for the first time. Why is it that the Battle of Bhima Koregao, where the Peshwa's army was defeated by the East India Company's army, is celebrated by Dalits? Because for a lot of Dalits, it was the, the, the British army had a huge Dalit component in that army, and they saw it as the defeat of a Brahmin ruler. So for them, Bhima Koregao is something they celebrate. But for a lot of Indians, it would look awkward, because here it is an Indian power being defeated by the, by the British. Colonialism opened up doors to lots of people. It opened up upward mobility for a lot of people. In Kerala, the Idava community moved up in society, became a huge political force, uh, gained moral and spiritual leadership under Sri Narayana Guru. But it was also aided by the way the colonial economy was structured, where the coir works that the Idavas worked on, suddenly there was an international market for it that colonial networks connected them to. And therefore, they were no longer dependent on local landlords and local masters. They were becoming cash rich. They were able to create their own enterprises and start acquiring land from local landowners. That's how they moved up in society. So again, it's not some kind of simple story of evil oppressors came, terrorized everybody uniformly and left. Colonialism had its local uh, you know, parties who cooperated with it. If you read William Dalrymple's The Anarchy, he talks about how the East India Company was bankrolled by Indians. Why? Because the East India Company paid its debts. Indian Rajas, <laughs> they might hang you upside down if you ask for your loan back, uh, you know, after a certain point of time. But the East India Company would pay back on time and therefore they ended up getting more credit from local bankers as well. There's a lot that's tied up in this, there's a lot that's mixed up in it. To understand it, we have to go in with an open mind as opposed to with these fixed dogmatic views that they were the villains and therefore that's the only way I can see them. Yes, it was oppressive structurally. But it's also very complicated as to what was happening, who was involved, why they were involved. It's, history is not always about finding the answers. It's also sometimes about provoking the right questions. And that's why it's energizing and it's interesting because it's making you think constantly and question your own dogma, question your own ideologies and question your own uh, sense of what the past was and was not about. You've opened up so many strands for me, I have to keep a hold on all of it. One, you mentioned the Rajas, and I want to come to uh, the Maharajas in your work, fascinating characters. You also talked about opening up questions, and I want to come to that. But before that, I want to ask you about a little detail. You mentioned Tipu Sultan, and you know, uh, there's been a lot of controversy over Tipu Sultan recently. Again, used politically by you know, different uh, factions in India, different political parties, some calling him a bigot, some calling him a national hero, etc. But a detail caught my eye. You know, it's true that he, uh, I think, hung 700 Iyengars on Diwali day. He, uh, you said, converted 4 lakh people in the Malabar, spoke of it as jihad. He, uh, 60,000 Syrian Christians, you know, that he tortured and got them converted. And then there's a little detail, which is that in the Anglo-Mysore War, it, I think you, you've written of it, that uh, uh, Bhau, th there was a Maratha chieftain who was part of the English army and they destroyed the Sringeri temple. And it's him, it's Tipu Sultan that, uh, that, that paid for the re resurrection of that temple, you know. So that's like a really interesting detail. Or in Sampat's, uh, in Vikram's work, he describes Raja Raja Chola as going to Sri Lanka and plundering the capital of Sri Lanka. But we, he's, we write of that as an epic raid, whereas uh, those that come and plunder 
uh, Indian capitals are then spoken of as, uh, you know, tyrannical invaders. So these are interesting differences in words. If Vikram was here, I would have asked him about it, but I just wanted to put it on the table. So coming to the Maharaja's uh, Manu, there's been this perspective that the Maharajas did not participate in, uh, you know, the war of independence, uh, that they were just lotus eaters, they were luxurious parasites on the backs of Indian society. Your scholarship completely, in a way, overturns that, you know. So one, what triggered you to do this? And do share with the audience two or three choice characters that completely change your idea of Maharajas. On the earlier point you were making, you know, these numbers that, are, that we have, 60,000, 5 million and so on, uh, most historians would be very circumspect about accepting a lot of these numbers because often there are conscious exag exaggerations in texts. In the Deccan Sultanates, there's, there was this Ahmed Shah Bahmani who, uh, there's a story that every time he killed 20,000 infidels, which is Hindus in this context, he would have a grand feast. Now, if you look at general population patterns of the time, the nature of the economy, etc., if he was really slaughtering 20,000 Hindus at a time, his entire system would have collapsed. It, it's simply not possible. Much of this was performative for, it's, it was, this is all written in Persian and Arabic, so it's performative for others in the Islamic world, where he's trying to indicate, look, I've gone into infidel country and I've completely terrorized these infidels. You can have an argument saying, oh my God, what is this culture that makes a virtue out of terrorizing people and, and killing infidels? That's a, that's a different debate, but the fact is you don't necessarily buy those numbers at face value and accept it. We even have a case, I think, in Bidar where in 1670, there's, a, there's an inscription that says the Mughal governor has destroyed the temple here and constructed this mosque. It's fake because the temple is quite new, the, 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 sorry, the mosque is quite new and the temple is still there. It's just, again, performative. You also have cases where, say, Aurangzeb tells um, his governor in Orissa, uh, destroyed Jagannath in Puri, you know, the great temple of Puri. And the, Mughal, and the Mughal governor there destroys an idol, but it's a fake idol, and sends off pieces to, uh, to Agra or Delhi or wherever the emperor is to convince him. But in reality, he's actually hidden away the original idol. Why? Because the pilgrim, pilgrim economy is worth a lot to him. He makes a lot of, of revenue out of it, so he can't, he can't obey the emperor's command. Technology came into these things, communication came into these things. Back in the day, news took time to travel. Sometimes somebody would give an order, they'd have no clue whether the order was being obeyed or not. So when we look at sources and these numbers, you're supposed to factor in all these elements and then reach a, a sort of conclusion as to whether it's likely, whether it's less likely. Is this person showing off for whatever reason, it may not be a reason we like, or is this person actually talking about having slaughtered 20,000 Hindus on a daily basis? I, I just wanted to share detail with them which actually reinforces your point. It's again from Manu's book where he says that talking about performative history and storytelling that uh, Tipu Sultan commissioned a painting of himself after one of the battles where he's really vanquished everyone where he's smelling a rose in the middle of carnage and the, the English, English, colonel. English colonel is biting his nails. You know? And seated <laughs> in a palanquin which is supposed to represent effeminacy and look, Tipu's on a horse, an oversized horse uh, God knows what the multiple <laughs> innuendos there are but, uh, and this man is sitting in a palanquin and chewing his nails. And it's a very visual thing in Sri Ranga Patna and it's a wall mural and it's quite right. striking. So anyway, Manu, as I said, there are lots of questions I want to ask you uh, from, uh, forgive me, I'm falling into that vocabulary of the other side and your side and all that, but there are lots of interesting discussions happening about Delhi-centric history, uh, you know, uh, demacolization of our brains, of our, of our memory. Uh, you know, of a lot of new subaltern stories. One of Vikram's books is about all the characters, you know, Lalita Ditya from Kashmir, uh, Lachit uh, Barua from Assam, Chan Bibi, Hazrat, you know, a lot of characters that what they call mainstream historians have ignored. So I want to bring all those questions up to you. But before that, like I said, share two or three stories of the Maharajas, you know. In fact, I can connect the Maharajas to this question that you asked. This whole business of Macaulay coming and saying, oh, you know, this class of Indians who are brown in color, but English in, in thought and intellect and so on. He said it. It doesn't mean it actually happened necessarily like that. Now, you look at the East India Company's expansion in South India. Look at the white men, but look at the Indians who were with the white men as secretaries, as clerks, as supporters. Later in princely states, the British residents would go and these guys would go with them and be installed there as ministers. They were Deshastha, Brahmins from Maharashtra, but many of them had come off to Tanjaur with the Marathas and they were 
find out from there. A huge amount of the East India Company's bureaucratic metal and brain was Maharashtrian Brahmins. It was Indians supporting the East India Company. Macaulay's, uh, Macaulay's famous like, remark doesn't necessarily mean it penetrated every level of society in that way. Indians were very, there is scholarly work that shows that Indians were very capable of going out into their offices and talking a language of liberalism and, and all of that, legalism and so on, and then coming back and doing their usual uh, Sandhya Vadanam, their rituals, getting their daughters married off at the age of eight and so on. People knew how to build these walls even then. Just as we like to build walls, they knew how to divide their, uh, how much they absorbed of British culture, how much they kept it out. So there is an overemphasis and an exaggeration of how much of an influence Macaulay had. It takes away agency from Indians. It assumes that we were just passively sitting there listening to what Macaulay said. No, we had ways of, of pushing back against that also. So and that's what the Maharajas also did, which is to push back in their own ways. Now, these ways could vary. Now, in, in, in Jaipur, it, it wasn't street agitation like Gandhiji. In fact, street agitation only emerges in the 1920s under Gandhiji's Congress. Before that, it's what people pejoratively describe as armchair politics. But what's interesting is that there were forms of resistance. For example, in princely courts, there'd be the British resident who comes. In multiple courts, they'd have arguments about whether the resident could enter with his shoes on or not. Now, it sounds very petty to us, but it was about the Raja asserting his power on his turf, saying that in my darbar, everybody comes in barefoot. The British obviously couldn't let this pass, so they would insist on going on in shoes. Uh, then there'd be another dispute over chairs. Now, we think, well, why would anybody fight over chairs? But the resident would insist that his chair should be on the right side of the throne because that was the more honorable side. And the Raja would say, no, no, you stay on the left side. You've always been on the left side. Sometimes these tussles could carry on for generations. In Hyderabad, two or three generations passed before the British resident got the right to wear the shoe. And that was only because then that particular Nizam who permitted it was a little boy. And his Divan or his regent had a, an understanding with the British and let it pass. In return, he got something. Often, there were Maharajas who were very good at sort of sucking up to the British in writing. Tukoji Rao Holkar of Indore wrote letters in which he said, oh, India was a broken heap of stones. It's the East India Company, the British who've come and built it into this beautiful edifice. So you think, oh, what a groveling, slavish kind of figure. But in reality, behind the scenes, he was writing letters to all the other Maratha princes saying, resist the resident, don't listen to what the British are saying. And the British themselves in their private intelligence reports describe his, him as a notoriously disloyal, seditious kind of prince. <laughs> because that's what was happening behind the scenes. Again, native agency. We were not passively sitting there. I'm not saying these Maharajas were great or wonderful or good people. All I'm saying is they were politically interesting people who had interesting ways of resisting. In, in, in Baroda, there was uh, Sayajirao Gaikwad plonked on the throne at the age of 12. Both he and the then Rani chose this 12-year-old illiterate boy, picked him quite literally from a farm where he was simply tilling and turned him into the Maharaja of Baroda thinking they could manipulate him. He grows up and becomes a man with a spine and a personality. Starts funding the Congress party. He's told not to fund the Congress party. He does it in secret. Starts attending the Congress meetings, giving speeches. If you look at his collected speeches, the number of times he uses the word national is, is actually quite fascinating. Hires a Congress president as his divan, as his minister. When he travels abroad, he gives audiences to revolutionaries. And when the British ask him, you know, quite alarmed about this, and, you know, he says, oh, no, no, these were just courtesy calls. But no, when a, one of the top Indian princes meets with revolutionaries, it's a way of endorsing what they're doing. And he allows his territory to be used to produce anti-British propaganda. So once the Bombay police raid Baroda territory and they find the, that under this like, nice little cover that says vegetable medicines is an actual bomb manual, a bomb making manual, which the Maharaj of Baroda is perfectly, so he's looking the other way and allowing revolutionaries to use his territory. And the moment the British ask a question as to why this is the case, the Raja doesn't answer. He instead says, on whose authority have you entered Baroda? It's my territory. You should, have had taken, you should have taken permission before you even raided my territory. So, Manu, you know, in fact, uh, you use a lot of these portraits uh, kind of made my understanding of this period more complex because we again always hear histories of wars, you know, uh, conquering and vanquishing. And uh, Home Minister Amit Shah recently said that historians should now write about all the battles where uh, Indian, you know, Hindus actually won battles rather than lost battles because we have this uh, sense of, uh, you know, emasculated sense of our history. But I think more than the battles, what's interesting about your work is that you talk about their industry, 
their interest in the arts, in uh, farming, in horticulture. Tipu Sultan was a great uh, sericulturist. But you have uh, Maharajas who were actually setting up a, a factory with Spanish workmen and American machines, etc., and using all of this actually to compete with the British. So, you know. You know, they, they had all kinds of strategies. There was um, Maharaja Uttaram Tirunal in Travancore who had a huge collection of clocks and mirrors. And every Englishman who came there thought he was some kind of eccentric because, you know, why on earth is he collecting all these things? But from his perspective, having all these international goods was a way of signaling to his subjects that he was a man with great reach. Here, since we are in Chennai, very close in, in Tanjavur, there was Sarfoji II, a Maratha prince whose kingdom was taken away from him, but he still had a, an annual uh, income from the British, a, a kind of stipend. And you put that to great use. He, every time the British came, they were surprised he spoke English very well. This was early 19th century. He had his own experiments with botany. He had experiments in education where he would mix... He would bring out European enlightenment knowledge, but wed it to local poetry, local styles and forms of learning, and try to disseminate that to the people. Very intriguing, very interesting figure. These, these were men who realized that they would have to do something in order to stand out. In a lot of princely states, they, there was this great determination to rule better than the British, because that's the only way you can disprove the British claim that natives don't know how to rule. Natives need to be civilized. So by beating the British at their own game, you were making a point. In Mysore, the Maharajas industrialized, and not, it's not industrialization for profit. These were white elephants. A lot of it simply guzzled money and gave no dividends to the Rajas, except they gave political and moral dividends, which is that, yes, we can do industry. We can have iron and steel works. We can have soap factories. We can have silk factories. We can do all this without the British coming in. We have the capacity to build this up ourselves. There is a reason why even Gandhi hesitated to criticize the Indian princes till the late 1930s. In uh, Sardar Patel, 1949, he's the one who integrates the princely states into the Indian Union. People forget that 20 years before that in Mysore, when some people complained to him at a public event that the Maharaja was, you know, bad to them or whatever, Sardar Patel said, you're lucky you have such a good ruler. If, you still, if you're still unsatisfied, there's something wrong with you, not the Raja. It's the same Patel 20 years later who integrates the states. It tells you about the shift in thinking. As late as the 1930s, the Rajas were seen very much as allies of the Congress party, not as weak figures. The British often needed them. The British wanted to dam the, the Ganga, and obviously a lot of uh, you know, Hindus were upset. They said, you can't you know, put chains on Mother Ganga and all of that. How was the conflict resolved? The British were foreigners. They couldn't come and do it. It was by bringing to the table Brahmins, Rajputs, Maharajas of different caste backgrounds, getting them to arbitrate that a solution was reached. So, uh, you know, the question I want to ask you before I'm going to open this up for questions uh, is that, you know, one of the quotes that uh, Vikram speaks of a lot is that truthifying of history. You know, he says that if you covered up a lot of these wounds, uh, then po political leaders at any point in time will exploit it and the wounds burst open. So in all this scholarship, uh, you know, I asked you earlier, but we kind of bypassed it. Are there... Uh, you know, do you think that we are in an interesting, productive, it's being used, I'm not going to get into the politics of it right now, I'm just asking historically, you know, there was a friend of mine in the audience who was saying, uh, what is a way of getting to know of our past more, you know, that there were Hindu uh, points of pride that were suppressed. So do you look at this period when there is a renewed interest in a Hindu past, quote unquote, uh, is it productive in any way? Has it challenged your perceptions in any way? And how would you perhaps shift the needle on that, uh, you know, and what is problematic about it? You know, I'm puzzled that we think we don't have Hindu points of pride for some reason, because we have plenty of Hindu points of pride. In, in Tanjaur, there was Muddu Palni who wrote eight, Erotica in the 18th century, great works of literature. We had poets like Shetraya, Purandara Dasa. We had people who've contributed, people who had ideas, people who had minds. We've had Krishna Devaraya, if you're looking at kings. We've had Martha and Varma in Travancore. There's no dearth of icons. So it's a bit puzzling that anybody thinks that somehow Hindu history has been uh, buried in this. It's not possible. How can you bury Hindu history? I think the thing is, there is a North centricism, which is partly because people, it's not because there's some conspiracy to focus only on the Mughals. Remember, the Mughals were the last empire in India that collapsed only in 1858. The kind of material and sources and evidence and art and monuments we have for the Mughals beats a lot of the other people. Vijayanagara collapsed by the 17th century. We don't have, very, we don't have that much about Vijayanagara. 
They're one of the reasons we also don't hear that much about Vijayanagara is because the evidence is slender. It sort of, it collapsed so many years ago that a lot of the evidence faded, as opposed to the Mughals who existed until 1858. The British succeeded the Mughals as the imperial force in India, and the British sort of played up the Mughals also. So they've registered in our consciousness in a certain way. Certainly we should tell other stories. I don't think there's any quarrel there. But again, making it this us and them game, oh, they have somehow dominated, therefore we need to talk, that's unhistorical. All stories deserve to be told at all levels of society. Pride does not simply come out of winning battles. I mean, that's a very hyper-masculine way of looking at the past, which then begs questions as to why do you need this, what is this craving for hyper-masculinity that you have? It, it comes from some other place, some sense of insecurity perhaps, which colonialism bred in, in a lot of Indians. But that's a different debate. We have plenty of points of reference, we just aren't looking at them. I, I look at Mirabai and I see somebody very inspiring and interesting. I look at Janabai, who almost 800 years ago, in a poem that a lot of women will perhaps relate to, begins by saying, God, do me a favor and kill my mother-in-law. <laughs> God, while you're at it, kill my father-in-law, my sister-in-law. She wants to bump off all of these people. But the point is, she's not talking about murder. She's a bhakti saint who's stuck in the kitchen. And she's basically critiquing the fact that as a woman, she's confined to the kitchen and therefore unable to exercise her intellectual powers and depth and breadth of mind. And therefore, she's expressing dissent against that. To me, that is inspiring. To me, when Mirabai, when she's told in her own poetry, she talks about how when her husband died, they said, you must commit sati. She said, no, I will not do sati. They tried to force her. They, she says, no. They sent a snake to bite her. She survives. They say, you can't meet men. She says, I will meet whoever I want to meet. And finally, she walks out of the palace and becomes a wandering saint. She had spine. She had personality. Why is it that we are moved only by women who commit johar? Yes, that was valor. Yes, that was important. And that is true. But we have women who've done things in different ways also, who have an originality of mind, who've had originality of action. We have sources of inspiration there. It's just we've chosen masculine pride as the only sort of pride, whereas I'm arguing there's lots of sources of pride. Let's look at the full picture instead of only looking at who won which battle and why. You know, that's, that's a very limited way of looking at the past. Uh, you know, as I said, I'm going to open this up, uh, but Jodhabai is another character you said, you know, I didn't know this. And I think the whole of Manu's scholarship is anti-homogenization. You know, I mean, there's a great attempt to create one narrative and the beauty of the work that you're doing and a lot of others are doing is to just complicate everything that we know about ourselves to know that all of it is contingent. So Jodhabai apparently have... Uh, 12,000, now you're making me embarrassed about throwing any numbers, but apparently had 12,000 infantry. Cavalry rank. Cavalry. Had a cavalry rank of 12. Even more masculine. She had the biggest ship, she had the biggest ship in the Red Sea and she could uh, issue firmans, you know. That is not at all how one uh, thinks of Jodhabai. Or, or any woman in the harem, you think of a woman in a Mughal harem, you think, oh, she's just sitting behind a curtain, lots of perfume, lots of ornaments, and just sort of lounging about doing nothing. No, she had trading practices, she had a huge economic network, she had one of the biggest ships in the world, the Rahimi. The Portuguese burnt it and they were kicked out of the court for the mistake of burning the Queen Mother's um, uh, ship. She took such an interest in things that in the indigo market in Bayana, which I think is in Bihar, an Englishman outbid her and she was so furious she had the English also kicked out at that point, I think, because she took an interest in the world. Being behind Parda did not mean women were without agency. They had plenty of resources from there as well. And Parda itself could be manipulated. There, the, in the Deccan Sultanates, there was a queen mother who, she was the regent, she had to deal with the minister. And she said, look, this Parda is getting in the way. So what she did is she gave him some of her breast milk to drink. He drank it and she basically said, now you're my son, no Parda. That was the end of Parda there. So, you know, Parda could be negotiated in interesting ways. In Jaipur, there was a queen mother in the 1830s. She hated the British and she didn't like the fact that the British were bringing Jaipur under control. So when her son was a minor and she was in charge, she had no issues meeting her darbaris, her courtiers, her ministers, perfectly happy. Anytime the British resident wanted to see her, she'd say, no, 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 Parda, Parda, Parda. It was one way of keeping him out and keeping all the Indians on this side. So women had agency, it's just that we are not looking in the right places in the right ways. We are so caught up in this victim narrative sometimes that we forget that there was agency always. As I said, even under colonialism, we had ways of resisting. Colonialism didn't just come and oppress us and we sat there getting oppressed. 
In every situation, we were able to push back in our own ways, and that's the fascinating story. It doesn't need to be heroic war. It doesn't need to be heroic sort of standing up and sort of I don't know, uh, putting a uh, you know impaling somebody or something. It can happen in very many more interesting ways. The railways were built by the British to move their troops around and for economic gains of their own. Gandhiji uses the same railway platform as a political pulpit. From every place his train would stop, he would give a bhashan, gather people around him. The infrastructure the British created for their purposes, Gandhiji subverted and used for his purposes. That is the real story. That is where the texture, the life, the complexity of history comes out. And we lose a lot of that in, in just looking at a few odd militaristic, hyper-masculine aspects of history. So, you know, you've brought up Gandhiji. So just while I'm reading the audience's uh, questions, do talk about, you know, he's been now frozen like a saint. Uh, but, you know, take up that question I asked about the Khilafat. If we are revisiting mistakes of the past, do you think that his support of the Khilafat was a mistake, that it complicated domestic politics? And your own interpretation of Gandhi being very different, you know? And just before I start reading your questions for myself, I just wanted to add one more uh, interesting thing from him. He's mentioned Krishna Devaraya, talking about complicating stuff that he was a lower caste, uh, he's the greatest Hindu king that we remember, but he came from the lower caste. No, his mother was from a non-royal background. There is a whole theory that she, I mean, that's one of the reasons why he wasn't in the original line of succession. He was the stronger prince, but his brother was in charge and the brother's children would have succeeded. And there's, of course, the famous story of how the brother tries to kill Krishna Devaraya, but the minister presents goat size and says, I've killed Krishna Devaraya. Brother dies, Krishna Devaraya comes back and seizes power. But there is a story that his mother, Nagi or Nagamba, was um, one of the maids in the, in the palace and that, you know, that's why he he wasn't in the original line of succession and there was something right. uh, complicated about his birth. But the story I was wanting to share with the audience is that while he's seen as that last Hindu bastion against, uh, you know, Muslim uh, destruction of Vijayanagar, a lot of his most fierce and visceral battles was with the king of Orissa actually, who used to never give him respect and most of his longest sieges were against the Urissa uh, king. Urissa, in fact, played up the fact that he was, you know, they used to taunt him about his birth. His so the Rajapati claimed, I am a pure Kshatriya, look at you, you're, you know, you're of inferior birth. And that rankled Krishna Devaraya a lot more than the, than the conquest right. or than the battles he had with the Islamic sultans of the Deccan. And, and to end on that complicated note that Jahangir commissioned a painting of Malik Ambar's head him shooting Malik Ambar's head because it was a Muslim that was stopping the Mughals from invading the Deccan, you know, and uh, Shivaji's grandfather and Malik Ambar, like Manu mentioned, uh, were together in the army pushing back the Mughals. So that kind of... I'll, I'll just add one point there, which is that when we say a Muslim, right, it's not one homogenous community there either. There are so many differences within it. Uh, a Malayali Muslim in Kerala could often be matrilineal, whereas matrilineal has no support in the Sharia. But that was a local custom. You go to you go to Calicut and look at the Mishkal Mosque. It was built by the same temple carpenters, masons. It looks very much in the pattern of a Hindu temple. No domes, no minarets. It's built in the local form. Kashmiri Islam was very different from what happened, in, say, Bhopal, for, you know, as another example. So when we again lump together people under one category, saying this is the Muslim, we forget that there's a lot of diversity within as well. When Aurangzeb conquers Golconda. Uh, uh, in, in the 1680s, his argument was that, oh, Golconda kings are Shia kings and therefore they are heretics and that's why I'm conquering. He uses that as an excuse to conquer. It's an excuse because his own mother is a Shia. His own generals are Shias. So it's simply an excuse to defeat and, and take over that kingdom. So within Islam also, there are so many categories and differences that we can't lump them all together. We're running out of time, so I'm sorry, I'm going to have to sorry leave that. Sorry for my long-winded answer. <laughs> no, uh, my long-winded questions. We're going to have to leave the Mahatma question hanging for the cocktails now. Uh, we'll have to leave some other questions, but there's a good one here, a question that reminded me of something I wanted to speak to, especially because our session is called Scholar Detective. There's Ashok Kumar, an actor, who's saying that he saw in the slides that Raja Ravi Varma's mother-in-law and husband were accused of murdering a person with a jackfruit. So you're the detective that uncovered this murder story. So I got into a lot of trouble for uncovering this particular story. But again, in, in my book, False Allies, I, Ravi Varma is the connecting thread. He's the one who goes to these states and paints, paints portraits and so on. So I use him as one running thread throughout the book. And in the course of that research, I came across, clearly the, the records had been wiped at some point in the actual archives in Kerala. 
But this murder was so sensational in 1862. I mean, who heard of somebody being killed with a jackfruit, you know, <laughs> hit against the stomach repeatedly? Uh, that it was covered in the press, including the international press. So the newspaper evidence survives where the rest of the evidence seems to have been sanitized and removed. And the, 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 the original news report basically said that Ravi Orma's mother-in-law, that lady in the portrait in the slide, she was having an affair, or rather undue familiarity, I think, the words they used in those days, with, uh, with uh, a servant called Madhavan. And her husband obviously was not very pleased and then had Madhavan killed. <laughs> Later, the story changed to say, oh, no, 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 she's a woman of great virtue. Madhavan had stolen jewels. That's why he was murdered with a jackfruit. But yeah, the jackfruit murder of 1862 is an interesting footnote to Ravi Varma's biography, which lots of people are very annoyed in his wider family that I had published this. But sorry, the evidence is there. History is not to flatter anybody. It's about what happened and, you know, <laughs> narratives around what happened. So I'm just going to read out a couple of questions that have come from the audience. And like I said, we have young people who's been listening to this on Zoom across uh, the country. So we'll take one question from someone young and then wrap this. Uh, I'm going to leave some questions hanging in the air. The Mahatma question that I asked you, was he wrong about the Khilafat movement? Ashoka, the great king Ashoka is now the subject of much debate that, you know, was he really the great king that we saw? Everything is up for debate and that's what makes a session like this so interesting. Uh, but here, will, will you get uh, whoever the students that have been listening to us onto uh, the screen? Hello, I have, a, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I feel history is subjective. It depends on culture, geography, religion, etc. But a historian's responsibility is to reach the most acceptable version. So how do you reach that acceptable version? Yeah, I, I sort of indicated that in earlier what I said, which is that we all have our biases. Now me mm. as a man in this country, born into a certain community, fluent in the English language, there are certain advantages I have, which say others from a different background might not have. Women have a different way of looking at the world considering, con uh, compared to men, for example. So, so long as you're aware of your biases and you follow certain ways of doing history, you can minimize the bias, you can minimize the subjectivity. You can never fully erase the subjectivity, you can't get fully rid of any kind of subjective qualities to your work, it will always be there. In any book I do, my signature is, is there, my tone is there, my voice is there. To that extent it will come in, but there are ways in which historians are trained to minimize all the other bits and try and be as objective as possible within the limits of the evidence that is currently available. Tomorrow new evidence comes into play, things will have to be revised. So history is also a discussion, it's also a debate, and it's not a fight. Sometimes on social media we think people are quarreling over history. It's not, uh, why should we be surprised? History is meant to be constantly debated, yeah. meant to be constantly asking questions, and for new things to come up in this way. I think the problem always is whether it's achievement or atrocity, it's interesting to know about it if we don't weaponize it, you know, and don't bring it to conversations about how we look at each other today. Uh, I'll just so, simply to that say that when you mentioned earlier that the Home Minister said we must do history this way, no good history has come out of government directives, so I wouldn't <laughs> place much <laughs> currency on that statement. Right. So on, on that note, thank you so much, uh, those of you uh, young people listening here, because one of the intents of Ignition, as I said, is the start of things. We constantly like to connect the young with the accomplished uh, and hope that their questions make us think as well. Uh, you know, Vikram Sampat's book, uh, the new one that he's done, starts with saying that Chinua Achibe, you know, the Nigerian writer said that until lions find their historians, history will always be the story of the hunter. And from what Manu has just said, that as much as we investigate history, we must investigate historians, you know, to know what is the story that we are being told. So thank you very much, Manu. Thank you. And on that count, I'll just recommend one book to people. T.C. Raghavan has written a wonderful book called History Men, which is about three historians of the early 20th century. Read that to understand how historians negotiate their own politics, their own ego battles, their own issues with language, their own sort of internal rivalries. All of this goes into the making of history. It's a delightful book. Do read it. And about history and the hunt and so on, I'm saying also that history is more than the hunt. There is a lot happening in history. It's not just about the hunted and the hunt. That's, that's the perfect note to end on. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll meet again in like 20 minutes because we have another very exciting session, again with someone constantly renewing himself. 
uh, Rana Dagubati. Uh, you know, I don't know if he's here right now. He said he'd come for this session. But, uh, you know, I, I told him that it's not every day that you meet someone who looks like Thor has married the Dotraki, you know. So it'll be wonderful to speak with him. See you back in 20 minutes. Thank you so much.